morning. I'd like for you, if you will, to open your Bibles with us this morning to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. And we want to begin reading with verse 22 through the end of the chapter. Well, let's begin with verse 21 because it sets the context for all that follows, and we're only reading a portion of that which follows. It says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Submitting yourselves one to another. And it goes through numerous relationships, husbands, wives, children, servants, masters, uh, and how that we are to conduct ourselves in these various relationships. Now we want to, this morning, particularly look at the uh, relationship here between husband and wife, and we want to speak Our subject is the institution of marriage and of the church. Verse 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, I was thinking about a phrase in here, and it brought into focus uh, the thought that we have to share with you this morning. And as we said, we're talking about the institution of marriage. And when we speak of an institution, we use that term, uh, such as when we talk about the institution of marriage. We're referring to the establishment of an organization or customs and refers to the general or typical arrangement of the rules, laws, or customs as they pertain to the whole, which is only applicable in the concrete, that is, each, all, every individual example or case. Sometimes we refer to it as the generic sense. So when we're talking about marriage, and we use the term marriage, we're talking about it as a, an institution. And so we define what marriage is. We Uh, as uh, Paul lays down here the instructions governing the relationship here of of husband and wife. And as in our text, the institution of marriage, it is something that is universally practiced, a custom whereby one man joins with one woman in a lifelong relationship of companionship and procreation, uh, which brings into... uh, existed there, the concept, the institution of the family. There's another institution, which is an outgrowth of of marriage, Uh, parents and children, which uh, he goes on to include here in his uh, discussion of submitting yourself one to another. Uh, But 
As we talk about marriage, Genesis 2.24, we see the institution of marriage. When God had created Adam, and then he created a helpmeet uh, for him, he created woman. Uh, In verse 21, and the Lord, uh, this is Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Verse 25, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And so we see here the beginning, the foundation, uh, the institution of the marriage relationship uh, between a man and a woman and uh, she is referred to here as his wife. And so, uh, in chapter 4, verse 1, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. And so this was in the marriage uh, relationship that is established here. Now, we speak about marriage in a generic or institutional sense. But whatever we say in general, as we talk about marriage, that's it. the union of one man to one woman for life, uh, and other customs that govern how that is brought to pass, how we recognize a marriage. Um, but whatever we say in general is only fulfilled in the concrete sense that is, in each couple, each husband and wife. Uh, as in our text states that each husband is to love his own wife. In other words, when we're talking about marriage, we're not talking about uh, some mystical grouping of all husbands and wives together. When we tip, speak of the institution of marriage, we're talking it in a general sense, but as we said, that which we how we define marriage, the rules that govern marriage, finds its fulfillment, its reality in each couple, each individual couple. One man and one woman that are brought together as husband and wife, that is marriage. And so, that which is said in general of the institution is applicable and find its reality in each individual couple. Uh, and so as our, our text mentions here, uh, wives submit yourselves to unto your, your own husband. See, wives are not subject to men in general. This is a misconception sometimes that uh, people have. We're not saying women be in subjection to men. The scripture says that the wife is to be in subjection to her own husband, nobody else. And likewise, the husband is to love and cherish and nourish his own wife, nobody else. Uh, and that simple phrase and understanding, and, and it seems like generally people really don't have a problem understanding that concept. When we're talking about the institution of marriage, we're talking about it in a generic sense as an institution, as a concept. And the rules that apply, and, and, and we speak of it in that sense, but they find their reality and they apply it to each individual case of a husband and wife. However, when it 
comes to applying the same understanding to the institution of the Lord's church, people have the most impossible time seeing and distinguishing when the scripture speaks about the church in the generic or institutional sense and that that governs and applies and only, only finds its reality in each individual congregation. When it speaks of the church in the institutional sense, it is not talking about some mystical body of all believers. Because as you look as the church is defined, as you look at the instructions given to the church, they can only be followed. Those instructions can only be followed when applied to a local congregation. It makes absolutely no sense to try to apply those things to some universal body. And so that was kind of the, the thought as I was reading this and, and said, you know, let every one of you in particular so love his wife. See, each one of you husbands in particular so love his wife. And the wives see that she reverence her husband. I said, you know, how simple. We understand that. And yet, in the very verse before that, he said, this is a mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and his church. And so everything that we talk about the church as an institution only finds its reality, its fulfillment in each individual congregation or assembly of believers in a location, in a local visible assembly. That's how we define the church. That's the meaning of the word ecclesia that Jesus used in Matthew the 16th chapter when he said to I will build my church. He's talking about the institution. But that church finds its reality as the word defines and is used as speaking of an assembly. Matter of fact, there's three places in the book of Acts where it's actually translated assembly. When it was talking about the local city assembly, which is where the term originally uh, was applied. But whenever it's talking about the institution of the Lord's church, they don't uh, translate it as an assembly, but that's what it is, an assembly or congregation. He'll build my assembly, my congregation. That's the institution. But it only finds its reality in each local church. Notice in Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, and he's talking to the Gentiles here, to the Ephesians. Well, let's, let's. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus. Which are at Ephesus. Now here he's speaking to a particular body. In Corinth, he says to the church of God which is at Corinth. Here he's speaking to the saints which are at Ephesus. Gentiles who before were uh, without the gospel. He says in verse 12, he said that at that time he were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. 
But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, that is, between the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, now, verse 19, it kind of gets to the point here. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And so he's speaking here of the institution of the church, as it is applicable to the saints which are at, at Ephesus, verse 20, in whom ye also, you saints at Ephesus. So what he says in verse 21, and this is what is important, in whom all the building, and actually in the Greek, you look it up. You get you Strong's Concordance, you get you uh, some kind of a dictionary of uh, New Testament Greek, uh, Robertson's word pictures of the New Testament, something like that, and, and look this up. And that phrase in the Greek says each and every several building. In other words, he's making that, he's talking in the institutional sense, but applying it to each individual building. Each individual group of saints at some location, such as at Ephesus, such as at Corinth, such as at Rome, and so on. Each one, this applies to. Remember how we talk about in the institution of marriage, that which defines and the rules and things that are set down that govern the institution finds its reality, its application in each individual marriage. One man, one woman, husband and wife and applies to them in equally, individually. And so, Paul is making that application here <clears throat> to the saints at Ephesus, that which is general, that which is true, and finds its fulfillment in each individual case, applies to you at Ephesus. That's why he's saying, in whom each and every building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also, also uh, are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The saints at Ephesus were built together, assembled together, as a habitation of God through the Spirit at Ephesus. And one of the things that we see too, as Paul was speaking, he said, God's given me grace as a wise master builder. And God's used the Apostle Paul to establish churches, to teach the churches and so on, to get them started. And God used him in a mighty way and gave him a great wisdom in doing so. And so what Paul is saying here, he said, now this is true of all churches and it's true of you at Ephesus. That each one being fitly framed together, being built together, becomes an habitation for God through the Spirit. And this is not only true of Ephesus, but it was true at Rome. It was true at Corinth. It was uh, true at Colossae and, and each of the other, Thessalonica and so on. And it's true here. This assembly, being fitly framed together, built it together, becomes an habitation of God through the Spirit. His Spirit indwells and empowers us as a church. And those things that, as we define a church and how a church operates on, applies to us. We take that which is spoken of John. And we can look at the instructions that Paul gave to the church of Corinth. Those instructions was not limited to the church of Corinth. 
and that he was, this is part of the instructions that is laid down to a New Testament church, it becomes applicable to us as well. And Paul, in that one letter to the church at Corinth, on several occasions made mention of the fact that this wasn't something new for Corinth, this wasn't something that was created specifically for them, but he said, this is what I teach in all the churches. Have you noticed that? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. He says, and he's speaking, you know, let's, chapter 1, verse 1, uh, or verse 2, under the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. And so he's speaking here specific to the church of God which is at Corinth. Chapter 4, verse 17 says, For this cause have I sent unto you, Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. That phrase, you know, when we look at it, when we think upon it, Paul did not believe or teach in some universal body called the church. The church is each individual assembly or congregation of believers wherever they happen to be located. The church of God was at Corinth. The church was at Ephesus, in Thessalonica, in Colossae, in Rome. And we see here that he teaches everywhere in every church. Now he wouldn't say that if it was all one big church. But he said, I'm teaching the same thing in every church. Because what is true, what is applicable to the institution in general becomes concrete and finds its fulfillment and reality in each individual congregation. And as we said, you know, in Matthew the 16th chapter, Paul or Jesus says, I will build my church. In the 18th chapter, he speaks about how to deal with an offense. And if we think of this in the context that these believers is going to find its fulfillment in a particular group of believers in one place. He says, if your brother offends you, now, and understand in Jesus' day and then in Paul's day, it's not like it is today in that you have a church building an assembly on every corner and each town, even some that are small, some small little village might have four or five so-called churches. It was not so in the beginning. That is not the New Testament pattern. Each location had one church. And so he says, if a, a brother offends you, and again, they didn't have TV, they didn't have the internet, you know, today, the brother or sister in, on the other side of the country can say something and offend me. They didn't have that in Paul's day. And so to some extent we have to kind of get ourselves out of the present and think as it was then and see how that is to carry over into our present rather than imposing the present on when these men spoke. And so in that time, you know, in, in a particular city there was just one assembly and travel from one to another was long and hazardous. And so each one, as intended, was its own independent little kingdom. That's what Ecclesia meant. When you, you go back and think of the original, the Greek city-states, each one was an independent republic 
in and of itself. And the ecclesia <coughs> was that governing body of that local city state. And they were very jealous of their autonomy and independence. And that was the term Jesus used to describe, this is what I'm going to build. It's going to be mine. My kind of ecclesia or an assembly. And each one is independent. It is autonomous. It is self-governing. And so within that self-governing autonomous body, if a brother offends you, will you go to your brother and you tell him his fault to his face in private? And if he hears you, you've gained a brother and it doesn't go any further. <clears throat> but if he will not hear you, then you take one or two brethren. And for this to work, as we'll see as this progresses, you're all members of the same body. You take one or two brethren and you go back to that person and again, and you try to resolve it. And you have witnesses there and you have their counsel. And if it gets resolved, it goes no further. But if you will not hear them, then you bring it before the church. And you have the two or three witnesses as to what was said. It's not he said, she said, you know, that sort of thing. You have witnesses as to what the issue was what was said, who said what. Now, the church is in a position to hear that and to make a judgment. That can only be followed. Those instructions can only be followed in a local congregation where the authority exists to bind and loose to forgive or to retain the offense is in the local congregation. You know, if someone who claims to be a brother and he is a member of some other congregation, some other denomination, how am I to follow those steps? I can't. Because if it gets to the point that we come before the church, what church do we come before? What universal mystical body do we come before and present our case? None exists. Christ's instructions can only be followed and carried out and obeyed when applied to a local congregation. And that's why Paul says, I sent Timothy to you uh, to bring into remembrance my ways that what Paul had taught them when he was there and the church was established. Which be in Christ. He says later on, so if any man think himself spiritual or a prophet, let him acknowledge that the things I say are the commandments of Jesus Christ. He says, as I teach everywhere in every church. And so, it's such a simple point, and yet it seems the truth of it is so profound that most Christians don't get it. They've been blinded by generations of false teaching and a false definition of the church. As marriage finds its reality in each couple, one man united with one woman for life, this is the biblical pattern, so the church finds its reality in each congregation, each local assembly, which is founded upon and follows the New Testament pattern. Any instructions given either generically as we said in Matthew the 18th chapter or to any one church uh, in particular is applicable to all in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 17. But as God hath distributed to every man as the Lord hath called every one so let him walk and so ordain I in all churches plural. 
See, before he said everywhere in every church, that is, each individual church in a different location, everywhere. See, wherever I go and there's a church singular established in that location, that's what I teach. And here he uh, again states it, and so ordain I in all churches. And then in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, he says, if any man, verse 16, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. That is, I believe in the Greek there, we have no other custom than this. And why he just talked. He said, this is the only custom that we have. And this is the only custom in the churches of God. Why? Because Paul taught the same thing in all the churches. And what he was teaching and instructing the church at Corinth was not peculiar to the church at Corinth, but was applicable everywhere in every church. Which is how he taught. Um, notice too, if you will, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In speaking of the church at Corinth, and he, he's discussing here the use uh, of the spiritual gifts, in particular the speaking in tongues and different things, and their misuse of it. But notice what he says in verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place. Now, can that be speaking about a universal invisible body of all the saved? Not in this life, not in this world. And yet that's what we're dealing with. It's here on this earth in this life. Paul talking to the church at Corinth. And he's saying when you, when all your membership come together into one place. And he says that again in reference to the Lord's Supper. That's you know, we get into that, the institution of the Lord's Supper, an ordinance of the local church. It's observed by each local church to its membership. The observance of the Lord's Supper as a local congregation, as elements are extended only to those as far as the authority of this church goes to discipline. If you're not a member of this church and we cannot discipline you, then that's the extent, the limit to which the elements are offered that we observe it as a local congregation. And, and he said there, they all come together into one place to observe the Lord's Supper. So I, you know, I don't believe, uh, I, I think it's improper to take elements out to individuals in their homes at different places. It's when the whole congregation comes together into one place. This is to observe the Lord's Supper. Here he's talking about. But again, it only finds its fulfillment, its reality. We can only obey these instructions when it is applied to a local congregation. Um, and if we come to the comparison in our text between the institution of marriage and the institution of the Lord's church is further justified for Paul himself says of this husband-wife relationship here, said this is a great mystery. Note verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The institution of marriage mirrors that relationship between Christ and His church. And we see the comparison all through here. The wife is compared to the church in her, the 
Her relationship to her husband is the church relationship to Christ, and Christ is the the husband is compared to Christ and his relationship to his wife, Christ's relationship to his church, back and forth, all through this, this text, and he says this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now again, the church, the institution of the church, this is speaking in the generic sense, but it only finds its reality in each local congregation as they are obedient to the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll start with verse 1, says, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so he's saying here to the church at Con, I'm, I'm jealous over you. I'm, labor, I'm, I'm like John the Baptist in the sin. I am the one, I have espoused you. I have given you and promised in marriage to one husband, and that's to Jesus Christ. You have no other head. You have no other authority than that of Jesus Christ. You have one husband, and as the wife is to be subject in all things to her husband, so the church is to be to Jesus Christ. He said, but I'm, I'm afraid. Said, if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus. So well, how can you preach another Jesus? Well, if you're preaching a Jesus that could have, that was tempted with sin, that could have sinned. There was that musical, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. And it presented a Jesus Christ that had lustful thoughts. That's preaching another Jesus. Uh, there is a Jesus set forth in a popular book and, and movie. Dan Brown, I believe, was the author of the book, The Da Vinci Code, or something like that. Presented a Jesus that didn't die on the cross, that he was a man, and that he survived, and, and he was hidden, and actually got married and had children. That's another Jesus. When you preach a Jesus whose sacrifice is not complete and is literally sacrificed again and again, that's another Jesus. That's another gospel, which he, he goes on here. Whom we've not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted. He said, I'm afraid lest your minds be deceived from the simplicity that's in Jesus Christ. And we be drawn away to another Jesus, to another gospel, another spirit. And churches have been. And they do preach another Jesus. They do preach another gospel, a gospel of salvation by works, by keeping the law, by doing something, rather than that salvation that is freely bestowed by His grace upon us through faith. That's another gospel. And so on. 
These are not New Testament churches. These congregations have not kept themselves unto the Lord, but have become spotted with the world. The scripture presents the picture of the church as the bride of Christ. And this will be fulfilled in glory and is the object of parables which speak of a great kingdom wedding feast. Which This morning in, in Sunday school we were studying the parables. We touched upon that, the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew chapter 22. Uh, again, it finds its fulfillment in, in Revelations chapter 19. Verse 7. It said, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And so it makes a distinction here. When we are saved, I was talking about this uh, in, in the Sunday school class about the wedding garments. The guests, those that are saved, they have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. They are saved, but they're not in the bride. How can you? The bride is not the guest at her own wedding. The guests are those saints, those that are saved but have never been members of one of the Lord's New Testament churches. We talked about that this morning, that there are many people, even in Christ's day, out of all those that John preached to and that came to him, so that the whole area came to his baptism, confessing their sins and was baptized of him in Jordan River. But out of all those and all those disciples that was made by Jesus Christ and his disciples, how many were in Jerusalem in that upper room on the day of Pentecost? There's only 120. And that might seem like a big crowd to us right now. We had 120 in here. But that was certainly not all those that had come repenting, confessing their sins, and were baptized of John. Many of them were saved, but they were not members of the church. Apollos was not a member of the church until he came to Ephesus. And it was taken aside by Aquila and Priscilla and was taught more fully the things of the Lord. And then he began to company with them in the church at Ephesus. And so there are many today and many saved people and many of the churches and denominations that we would not recognize as true churches of the Lord Jesus Christ that may be saved. Good godly people love the Lord, trying to serve the Lord to the best of their knowledge. They will be the guests at the wedding. It said, but to her was granted. See, this is a distinction made. That she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen here is the righteousness of saints. We're not talking about the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, but the actual righteousness of his saints that were obedient to him. Paul says, I have espoused you and one husband as a chaste virgin, and they remain chaste. In the book of Revelation, the letters to the churches, the church at Sardis, he said there are a few in Sardis that have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Those who are members of true New Testament churches and who remain faithful in those churches compose the bride. I believe that is the teaching that is consistent with the scripture that which the scripture teaches. We know that his church is his bride. 
Uh, we see here that the home will be the new Jerusalem. And again, notice here uh, in, in Revelation chapter 21, uh, verses 1 and 2, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I believe that indicates that that will be the home of the church. So how about all the saved? Are all the saved going to be in the New Jerusalem? No, they're not. The Bible specifically states, if you will notice, uh, well, let's notice verse 9, it said, There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither. And I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And so he said, this is the bride, the Lamb's wife. Over in chapter 21, verse 23, the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. So there's a new heavens and a new earth. The new earth is inhabited. Who inhabits the new earth? The nations of the saved. There upon the earth, walking in the light of the city, but the city is said, this is the bride, the man's life. So not all the saved are in the bride. Not all the saved, well, their home will be in the city. But that's where the Lord is, and we're his bride, and we'll be at his side, while the nations of the same walk in the light of it. And so, not all who profess to be Christians are truly saved, and not all who are saved will be in the bride. One must walk worthy of the Lord and keep themselves unspotted from the world. Each church and each individual in each church is responsible to watch, to be separated unto the Lord as a chaste virgin, that we may make up that glorious and elect group of believers that will walk with Jesus in white as his wife for eternity. Again, the pattern for marriage is for life, as long as they both shall live. And seeing that Jesus ever liveth, our marriage to Him is forever. So shall we ever be with the Lord. I hope these things have made sense or have been able to kind of make sense of what seems to be to uh, many people a difficult concept to understand. As I said, I believe people's minds have been blinded by generations of false teaching and teaching in some universal mystical body that is composed of all believers. Well, there is such a body. It's called the family of God. All those that are saved, that are born again from all the ages, compose the family of God. But that's not the church. They're confusing the family with the church. The church finds its reality in each local congregation. Each local congregation is responsible to be obedient to the commandments of the Lord and is not subject to anyone else. You've been a spouse to one husband, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the head of this congregation. I'm not the head of it. I'm not the leader. Christ is the head. This is His church, His body. We've been joined unto Him. Each true New Testament church enjoys that relationship. And we're responsible to Him. Let us stand together. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior, is our Lord and Savior.
believing and trusting that He died on the cross for our sins. And if you know the Lord is your Savior, you know that you trust Him and you need to follow the Lord in scriptural baptism and become a member of one of His New Testament churches. And there you need to put your life, your lamp, that it might give forth light. There we can be taught and grow and edify one another and together grow, as we said, into a uh, holy building and habitation of God through the Spirit. Let us... 393.